All right, so in the last couple of uh, videos, we looked at area integrals, right, and, and integrals for scalar functions. So we said, okay, if the, if the function here is just identically one, then what we have here is essentially an integral that computes area for a surface, so surface area. You can also introduce scalar fields. Uh, we didn't talk too much about what that should mean. Um, you can probably come up with some uh, examples where this is some sort of maybe like a mass density or a charge density or something like this. Um, so gen generally, you're interested in some kind of density. And in fact, gen um, when you generalize this, when you get into higher math, this type of integral is, is often referred to as a density, or the object you're integrating here is, is often referred to as a density. Um, when you generalize these things, you talk about certain transformation properties uh, that they have. The important property that a density has is it is completely independent of the parameterization. Right? Any parameterization for the surface integral you choose, you will always get the same answer um, for this integral. But now we want to move on to another context. We want to look at what happens when you're dealing with vector fields. And, and this notion of what's called flux. So what we're doing now is we're, we're moving to a situation where we have some vector field in space, okay? So you have a vector field in space, so you've got you know, vectors everywhere. This green pen is not great, but that's okay because I don't really want these vectors to show up all that much. So everywhere in space, you've got vectors, right? And, and those vectors, maybe they represent, you know, um, they could represent an electric field, a gravity field. Maybe it's the flow of some fluid. Um, flux is this measure of, you know, if, if this vector field was some sort of flow, how much is flowing across your surface, right? Uh, this is the idea. And, and so the thing that matters when you're, when you're measuring flow is, well, what really matters is the normal component of each vector. If your vector is tangent to the surface, then your fluid is flowing along the surface. It's not going across, right? So nothing is crossing. Um, we just want to know how much of your vector field is perpendicular to the surface. That's the part of the vector field that's actually going to cross the surface. Um, so what we do is, is given, so given a vector field, you know, uh, F, we can compute, um, you know, in, in our surface, um, surface S, the, we can look at the normal component. So the normal component would be F dot n, where what's little n? So little n here is your unit normal vector, all right? So little n is this unit normal. And so once you've chosen a parameterization, right? We, we, we're not yet talking about a parameterization. Um, so in terms of a parameterization, n is going to be the, the big N that we've been working with all along, divided by its magnitude, right? That's what little n is giving you. Um, and what you want to do is you want to think of this normal component, right? If you think of this, this vector field as describing, let's say, again, some fluid that's flowing, and we have this idea of flux. We're not defining this carefully, maybe, but um, so flux is this measure of, of how much fluid is flowing across your surface. Um, and so we can think of this quantity here as being something like flux per, per unit area, right? We have this idea in mind. Uh, now, 
with um, with scalar fields, I mean this this of course this is a scalar. Once you take the dot product, you have a scalar. Um, but these densities that we were looking at before, right? They're they're completely like I said, they're completely independent of the parameterization, um, including whether or not the parameterization respects the orientation that you have in mind for the surface. Um, but if you're computing flux, right, this idea of flowing across, going from one side to the other, then you need to differentiate between you know, one side of the surface and the other. You need to have a choice of orientation. So you need to decide, you know, your normal vector, is it pointing, so for this picture, is it pointing up or is it pointing down? There's two possible directions, right? There's two possible unit normals, uh, upward pointing and downward pointing. Right. In this picture here, if, if everything is sideways, maybe it's going to be left pointing, right pointing, you know, or maybe it's inward pointing, outward pointing, if it's something like a sphere. So, so there are two choices of unit normal depending on orientation. And if you flip the unit normal, that's going to flip the sign, and that's going to change your answer, right? Your answer will be off by a negative if you change the orientation. Um, so, so this quantity, it doesn't quite depend on the parameterization um, as long as you put this condition in that your choice of parameterization has to respect the orientation. So this normal vector that you compute here needs to point in the same direction as the unit normal that you've chosen for the parameterization. Um, once, you've, once you've kind of made these, uh, these identifications, you've made these choices, then you can compute the total flux. So the total flux is just going to be what you get when you integrate this thing, right? So the total flux is going to be the integral over S of F dot N. And we integrate with respect to surface area, right? Um, so the dependence on normal, uh, on the dependence on the orient orientation is, is buried in here, right? This part doesn't care about the orientation, but this does. Um, now, uh, one of the things that you might notice is that once you parameterize, right, um, for, for any parameterization that you happen to choose, right, what you're going to get, <coughs> at least for a parameterization that respects the orientation, is you're going to get, well, so this is going to be F of R of UV, right? The unit normal, it's sitting here, is N of UV divided by the magnitude. Okay, we have that. But then we have this ds, and we know that ds is, once we parameterize, it's the magnitude of the normal, and then du dv. Ah, so one of the things that you'll notice is that that magnitude cancels out, right? We had a similar thing happen uh, with line integrals of vector fields, right? We, when we first introduced line integrals for vector fields, we were computing the tangential component of the vector field, right? We wanted to know how much was going along the curve, so we dotted with the unit tangent. Then we realized that, you know, that normalization factor was going to cancel out, so it wasn't really worth our while to, to bother. Um, so what you get, once you cancel, you get something that looks like this. The integral over d, f of r of uv dotted with n of uv and then we integrate with respect to u and v, right? So we, we basically, we compute our normal vector, we parameterize our vector field, we take the dot product, that gives us some function of u and v, and then we integrate. Now, this, um, this combination here, normal vector times du dv, uh, this is often referred to as sort of the, the, the vector ds, right? Just like we had the dr vector for line integrals, we'll write ds with the vector over top. So when you see the arrow, the little hat on top, um, that's going to be different than this ds, right? This ds is a surface area element. This is sort of this almost like a flux element. 
And, and so the other way that you'll write this is you'll write this as the integral over s of f dot ds, okay? So you'll often see it written that way as well, okay? We'll do a couple of examples, and then we're going to move on to the, the last couple of results in the course, um, Stokes' theorem and the divergence theorem.